understand that my broken heart is a part of your plan. When I try to pray, all I got is hurt.
Sergio, are we all good? Yes, so good evening to those of you who are here and to all those joining us online as well. So the great thing about um, one of the positives that come out of COVID is our, how we delved into live streaming and um, now we re record all the, these sessions. So not only for those watching live, but it will be, it'll be available in the future, we'll be able to push this talk out through our um, various communication means. So thanks for being here. You know, so we have this adult faith development series now. This is the first year of a the three-year plan, and we've been looking at the creed this year, and uh, this is the, f the, f the final piece of it, suffered, died, and rose again. So when thinking about who might speak, uh, uh, I, 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 when I was talking with, with our, uh, the team up to put together the whole series, uh, we thought about, about Paul as a person for that. Uh, to Dr. Griffiths, who's well known to us, was a member of our parish for many years and worked with our RCA process, and, uh, and while he was on the, uh, the uh, on, the, on, the, on the faculty at Duke Divinity. So Paul was born in England in 1955 and was lived and educated there until 1980 when he came to the United States and completed his studies. Since 1980, he's lived mostly in the U.S. and became a United States citizen in 1994 and was received into the, into, into the, the, the Roman Catholic Church in 1996, having been previously practiced his faith in the Anglican Church. He has two children and four grandchildren. So he's held academic positions at uh, the home of the Fighting Irish, the University of Notre Dame, the University of Chicago, the University of Illinois at Chicago, and at, and I mentioned at, 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 at Duke University, but hopefully you have some Tar Heel Blue in use somewhere, maybe a little bit. Just only a tiny bit. A tiny bit, yeah. yes. So, right. so uh, Dr. Griffiths is now retired from academic life and lives mostly in the mountains of Western North Carolina where he reads, writes, and hikes in approximately equal proportions, right? So he is, he's published 15 books as sole author, seven more as co-author, editor, and hundreds of articles, essays, and translations, and so on, as he put in his bio. His two most recent works are why read read P P Pascal and regret a theology? He's completed the first full English translation of of of, of uh, Pascal's Ecrisulagras. I'm learning Italian now, so I don't know French. But why don't you say it for me? Ecrisulagras. That's what I meant to say. Yes, <laughs> which is being considered for publication by Oxford University Press, and now at work at a book whose tentative title is Israel: A Theological Grammar, and also a frequent contributor to Commonweal, a number of journals and magazines. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Griffiths. Well, thank you to Father Scott for that kind invitation. Are we okay for sound? Yes, good. Let's begin with a prayer, shall we? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dearly beloved Father, giver of all gifts and source of all mercies, please fill our hearts and our minds with your Spirit. And please help the words we speak and the thoughts we think to serve the truth and glorify you. We ask all this in nomine Jesu Christi Domini Nostri Filii Tui, qui te convivit et regnat in unitate spiritus sancti, Deus per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. That will be enough Latin for tonight, I think. Um, I will talk for um, 35 to 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have some Q&A, I hope. Um, First of all, thanks for coming out on a Saturday night to discuss cheerful topics such as suffering and death. Not the obvious way to spend a Saturday night, but uh, not a bad one, perhaps. Um, the words that provide the title for this talk, suffered, died, and rose again, are creedal. They are creedal affirmations fundamentally about Jesus. But they are also about us. So in understanding what it means to say that Jesus suffered, Jesus died, and Jesus rose, that provides a window onto what suffering, death, and resurrection mean for us in our lives, for human creatures in general. So I want to start with Jesus and then move to us. But the task throughout will be to weave together these three things, suffering, death, and resurrection, to show how they work together and what the texture, the fabric of Catholic thought about them is. 
So that's what we'll try to do tonight. I want to begin, though, even before thinking about Jesus, with three vignettes from the Catholic tradition. Because Catholics have given enormous attention to these matters, matters of suffering, death, and resurrection, both of Jesus and of us. And the tradition is varied, complex, and sometimes in tension with itself. So I want to pick three little instances that you can then keep in mind, and I'll come back to them at various points as I go through the talk. So the first is um, from St. Augustine, um, from his work, The City of God, published, uh, written and, and made public in the second decade of the fifth century. And in the first book of that work, he asks a pointed question. And the question is, on the length of our lives, whether it matters? And his decided answer is that it does not. It does not matter how long you live. Whether you live a month or a hundred years is not to the point in a certain understanding for a certain context. It's not to the point with respect to your life with and relationship to the Lord. It's not a natural thing to think. We tend to grieve the deaths of the young more than the deaths of the old for obvious enough reasons. But it's important to keep that little thing from Augustine in mind. It's not a complete account, but it's something it's worth bearing in mind. Second one, let's step forward um, 1,350 years or so. So in the 17th century, Blaise Pascal, whom Father Scott mentioned in his introduction, someone I've spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, wrote the following words, and I'll quote him directly. Um, in English, though, not in French. He's writing now about death. Imagine a number of people in chains, all condemned to death. Each day, some have their throats cut in full view of all the rest. Those who remain see their own condition in that of their companions, and looking at one another with grief and without hope, wait for their turn." Close quote. Now that's stark. And it's not the complete truth, but it is true. We are surrounded by people who will die. We are one of them. Sometimes we see those deaths vividly, directly, and up front. It's not unusual to see people die. It's maybe less usual for us than it has been for most humans throughout most of history. But even for us, it's not that uncommon. I'm 65 years old. I've seen four people in the course of my life pass from death to life. It's a dramatic, uh, from life to death, not the other way, sorry. From life to death, that's a dramatic thing to see. And of course, it's much more common to see dead bodies. They are also dramatic in their own way. So Pascal is partly right. He's identifying something fundamentally important about human life, which is that we are surrounded by death. We know it. We cannot help but see it. And we also know and see that our own life is moving to that end. Nobody sitting here, I look around, will still be alive 50 years from now. Many of us, including me, will be dead long before that. So these are truths, and they are part of what the Christian tradition responds to. Pascal is a great writer, so he puts it very pointedly, and that's a very direct uh, instance. Third example. Thérèse of Lisieux, a saint and doctor of the church who died in 1897 at a very young age, 23, died of what we would call tuberculosis. Uh, in the last year of her life, when it became evident to her that she was suffering from that disease, for which at that time there was no cure because it was before antibiotics, which treat it effectively, when she began to cough blood, which is one of the signs of the decay of the lungs that that illness produces, she welcomed that event with a prayer of ecstatic gratitude. Gratitude for 
the fact that she would be able to participate with Jesus in his sufferings. Now, this should sound difficult, right? We don't ordinarily, we Catholics as little as anybody else, we don't ordinarily respond to the imminence of our own death, the physical symptoms of that, with delighted gratitude. And I'll later say a couple of words about why what Therese there says also isn't a complete account. But there's something in it, though, that needs to be remembered, which is that one of the things that the Catholic tradition preserves about suffering and death is that when we do it, and we will do it, if we're not already doing it, we will suffer, we will die. When we do it, we do, in fact, participate in something that Jesus has already done. And that that changes the complexion, the texture, the feel, or it can, of those dreadful things. So keep those three things in mind. Augustine, it doesn't matter how long you live. Pascal, you're surrounded by death. It's horrible, and you don't really know why, and it's coming for you. Therese, an active welcome, an active gratitude for the signs of one's own imminent death. So bear all those in mind. Now, let's think together about Jesus. It's always good for um, Christians to think about Jesus. Even theologians can sometimes manage that, though it's more tricky for us. These words then are creedal affirmations about our Lord Jesus. Jesus suffered, Jesus died, Jesus rose. Let's remind ourselves and lay the basic groundwork for this. Jesus, according to our understanding, is a single person who is fully human and fully divine. That's the essence of the idea of the Lord God, the God of Israel, the God of the church, taking flesh, becoming a single person who is fully human and fully divine. That person, during the course of his life, is arrested, tortured, executed, and buried. That is also a fundamental affirmation of our faith. That's what we say creedally. It's part of the fundamental uh, belief of the Catholic tradition. It's sometimes too easy for us to gloss over it, though. The sufferings of Jesus in his preparation for and his crucifixion are intense and horrible. And at various points in the history of the Christian tradition, they have been emphasized and shown to be that. And at other points, they have receded into the background. The tradition is various about this. Sometimes the church has focused very intensely upon the sufferings and the death in all their gory horror. At other times, they have been treated more as a distant reality. So there's a range of possibilities here in terms of one's response to it, but it should never be forgotten that Jesus does really completely suffer and die. And if you think about the liturgies of Easter, the litur liturgies of the three days from Good Friday to Sunday, you'll see how all this works liturgically. There's a real death, a real absence, a real bringing to a breathless pause of everything before the resurrection. But there is a resurrection. So Jesus rises from the dead, returns to life with the very flesh that he died with. So the resurrection is not of a new body. It is of the same flesh that died. And the stories that you all know from Scripture and the way that the church celebrates those make this abundantly evident. And this, too, is a central part of our affirmation about Jesus. But why all that? Why do we need to say, why do we say about Jesus? Why did Jesus, in fact, need to do that? Why did Jesus do that? It's puzzling, to put it very mildly. That affirmation at the very heart of the Christian faith is the thing that makes Christianity so strange, alien, unpalatable. There's no way to get there by argument. There's no way to make it 
on its face plausible, it doesn't figure among Thomas Aquinas's five ways to arrive at the affirmation of the existence of God. It's something much odder than that. The oddity of it is that God suffers, God dies, and God is resurrected. The part of that that I want to focus on for our purposes tonight, there's an enormous range of things one could say about it, but the part of it I want to focus on for our purposes tonight is what Jesus' death and resurrection do to death. It's a commonplace in our liturgies to hear things like, you heard it tonight, um, if you were at Mass just now, um, that Jesus has destroyed death. That's one kind of image, that Jesus' own death and resurrection has done something to death. One version destroyed it. Another version transfigured it. Another version overcome it. Another version emptied it out. Another version had victory over it. All these things can be said and are. There are theories, developed theological theories, about all these ways of talking, which I'm not going to go into, but I do want us to keep in mind that something has happened to death as a result of Jesus' death. Jesus comes for that purpose. And what the very brief version of the story of Jesus' suffering and death shows us most fundamentally, the thing I want us to focus on most intensely tonight, is that death is a fundamental, horrific instance of damage to the way things are. It is not how things are supposed to be. It has no rooting or grounding in any of the Lord God's intentions in bringing a cosmos into being and us in it. It is an offense. It is an object of lament. It is a tragedy. And it is the most fundamental damage that is evident in the cosmos. There is, on that register, nothing good to say about it. Why? Because there's nothing good about it. It is simply lack, damage, horror, removal. We can see that about it precisely because Jesus is resurrected out of it. That central pivotal event shows what death eventually will lead to and what, without Jesus, it does not lead to. And that is life. Death gets transfigured into life in a way that would not otherwise be possible. And that shows us then that the fundamental thing that Jesus comes to deal with is death and that he deals with it by this, by suffering, dying and rising. So that's the groundwork of what we want to say about Jesus. I want to note a couple of things about it before moving on to us, because there are some things that can easily enough go wrong in our ways of thinking and talking about Jesus' suffering and death. One thing that can go wrong is for us to treat it as though it were a pretense, as though Jesus being God, of course, doesn't really suffer and die. It just looks like that. That's a fundamental mistake. The suffering and death have to be treated as real in every way. If they are not, the heart of what is here being affirmed is removed. So one kind of mistake is that, to minimize, to, um, to eviscerate, really, the heart of the gospel by not attending fully to the suffering and death of Jesus. Another kind of mistake, more subtle and I think more common, is to think that Jesus simply removes death. That clearly isn't right either. The most obvious reason is that we, the recipients of the grace of God, baptized into the very flesh of Jesus, participant in Jesus by our baptisms, we too die. Death has not gone away. Death is transfigured, but not removed. It's not then that being baptized, of course, none of you thinks this, but sometimes you hear Christians talk this way. It's not that being baptized means there are no more problems. 
It doesn't mean that you won't die. It doesn't mean that you won't suffer. It's obvious that that's not what it means. But it's important to say that what Jesus does is not to simply erase death, not to remove it from the fabric of the cosmos, but rather to transfigure it, to turn it into something that otherwise it would not have been. And this is an absolutely central thread for the Christian tradition in general. Um, one of the things about Christianity in general, but I think Catholicism in particular, is that nothing is ever erased. Everything is always still there. It can be transfigured. It can be made better. It can, goods can come from it that otherwise would not have been there. But it's never removed. Nothing about you, not the worst things you have ever done or the best, are ever erased. They can be transfigured. You can be forgiven your sins. But they're not erased. They are part of the fabric of the world. Similarly with death. Death is there, but now transfigured. So it's a mistake to think of it or talk of it as though it is to be removed, uh, has been removed by Jesus. So with all that in mind, with those very brief and inadequate remarks about Jesus in mind, I'd like us now to turn to what that teaches us about how to think about, respond to both our own sufferings and death and the sufferings and deaths of those around us. What do we learn from this? How can we begin to approach these things? Let's remind ourselves of some fundamental things that flow out of what I just said. If it is the case that death is not the way it's supposed to be, that death is not what God intends for us, then something needs to be said about why death at all? How did things go wrong? Why, is, why are things as badly damaged as they are? The brief answer to that, of course, is that death is an artifact, a product, a making of sin. It is a product or making of the fall. Without the fall, without human and angelic sin, we we'll keep both human and angelic sin together, but we won't talk about the angels tonight. Um, without sin, there wouldn't be any death. So that's the first thing to say. That's the beginning of a causal account. But the second thing to say is equally important. It is that this particular instance of damage this particular instance of um, what we are suffering is not without remainder due to our own sins. We are not mortal because we individually sinned. And this is where a thing that, again, is difficult for many contemporaries to accept has to be said. We come into existence as inheritors of damage passed to us. If we don't say that, if we say that death is the result of sin, and then everybody's going to die, and we deny that it's inherited, then we're going to have to say that death is the result of every individual sins. But that can't be right. We can see that it can't be right, because death is universal, and it happens without respect to the degree of sinfulness that an individual has undergone. So when the, the long tradition talks about things like original sin, the fundamental idea is that we come into the world now, all of us, as inheritors of many kinds of damage. The most obvious one is death. We come into existence as mortal. This is not how it's supposed to be. We are already damaged. There is a way through that, a transfiguration of it, but it cannot be denied that this is the truth of us, I think. Uh, everybody who has children knows that the thing they have done is cooperated in bringing into being somebody who will die. That may not be the first thing you think, but it's not too long before you start thinking it, right? I mean, parents are very concerned to try to protect Augustine, does it matter? No, not really. But still, parents are very concerned to do that. Why? Because we know. We know that we have cooperated in bringing a mortal into existence. And we also know that that is not how it's supposed to be. 
So that, that, that thing about our, our own sufferings and death, that they are in part inherited damage, needs to be borne in mind. A very brief sidebar here. I'll just mention it. We can talk about it in Q&A if you want to. The tradition does preserve some interesting examples of human beings who may not have died. Exceptions, it may seem then, to um, the universality of death. If you read the scriptural accounts of Enoch and Elijah, for example, which I recommend you do, uh, you'll see some interesting things there. And I'll leave it to you to think about what they might mean. It may be that um, one of the meanings of those accounts, those Old Testament accounts of Enoch and Elijah, is that they were received into heaven without dying. That may be so. So that's interesting to think about. Otherwise, though, death is universal. There's also Mary. Mary is a wonderful example. All I'll say about Mary is that the church's dogmatic definition of the dogma of the assumption, Mary's receiving, being received into heaven, is extremely careful not to commit itself as to whether Mary dies or not. It simply says, when the course of her earthly life was completed, very carefully chosen phrase. So the tradition is open, I think, to Mary dying or not. And there are both views widely evident and widely argued for in the tradition. And you can see why that would be. So these are, that's a sidebar. We could, those are interesting highways. Yeah. Sure. Let's try that. Um, <clears throat> right. Is that OK? Yes? Was that the noise up there? Yeah, it's yeah. Because you were yeah. Right. I should have shaved better this morning, probably. Um, <laughs> right. So back to the diagnosis of our own, um, our own sufferings and deaths in the light of Jesus's. If, as the church teaches, one way to think about what death is, our death, is the separation of soul from body, where soul shorthand, whatever it is, that belongs to us that is not reducible to this. I won't here go into detail about what we might think of in terms of the soul. But if death is a separation of soul from body, then one of the things that tells us is that something of us, our souls, can exist without our bodies. Discarnate existence, if you like. Separated souls. Let's pause on that idea for a moment, though. It's a very strange idea. Why is it strange? Well, because according to commonsensical understandings and according to sophisticated theological understandings and according to the dogma of the church, human creatures, us, are definitionally and necessarily enfleshed or embodied. If we are not enfleshed or embodied, we are incomplete. There is something about us lacking. So when we speak of existing as a separated soul, what we mean is that something of us exists in that way, but not us fully. We are not fully in existence until we are soul and body joined. So when we die and our soul is separated from our body, it is not that we cease to be, of course, but it's also not that we exist fully. We exist tenuously. We exist incompletely. We exist, as the tradition sometimes likes to put it, Augustine is good on this, we exist with a yearning to be reunited with our body. There's something about us that's fundamental to us that just isn't there. So that's extremely important to bear in mind because only with that idea in mind, I think, can we make full sense of the idea of resurrection. So go back to Jesus. Jesus doesn't just die and exist as the second person of the Trinity disembodied forever. No. Jesus is resurrected enfleshed, risen as the flesh. And so are we. We too will be resurrected. 
eventually. We too then, with Jesus as our, as our precursor and our model and our um, ideal typical understanding of this, we too will be resurrected and fleshed. This is easy to forget, I think. It's easy to forget because we rightly, as a church, talk about our dead, the communion of saints, as though they are fully present to us. And they are, in a way, present to us. We can pray for them. They can pray for us. We have all kinds of back and forth with them. Um, we've got, for example, coming up, the, uh, the three days of All Hallows' Eve and All Saints and um, All Souls, when all this comes really very much to the fore, right? The dead are all around us, and we can have interaction with them. We talk that way. We should talk that way. But it can easily lead us to forget that those dead who have not yet been resurrected, even the saints, are yet lacking something. They are yet lacking exactly their resurrected bodies. That won't happen until the general resurrection at the end, the end of all things. So when we have interactions with the community of saints, we should always think of this about them. They, some of them, the saints, are living in the fullest relation to the Lord God that is possible for a human creature not yet fully enfleshed again. So it's not that there's anything problematic for them. They are in a kind of delighted ecstasy, we should probably say. But still, things are not yet as they should be. There is something yet to happen. That something is the resurrection that Jesus has already showed us. And importantly, the resurrection is not just of any old flesh. It's of whatever makes your flesh yours. What that is is hard to say, um, because if you think about, we know biologically that there are no cells that currently are present in my 65-year-old body that were here even 30 years ago, much less 60 years ago. They've all been replaced. So what is it that makes my body mine? Is it as it is now? Is it as it was when I was five? I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, the church likes to speculate about this. Theologians do anyway. Uh, Augustine, my favorite theologian, I suppose, would like to say that um, your resurrected body would be your body at your best age. What's that? He, he, thought, he thought 30 was the, was the age to, to say. Uh, you know, this is speculation, of course. So, but the point, the point is that even though we don't know quite what it means to say that it will be your body, it will still be your body. It will bear on it the marks of the history of your flesh somehow. It will be yours. It may not be recognizably yours, though. And to think about why that might be, we should remember the gospel accounts of Jesus' own resurrected flesh. Half the time, almost exactly, half of the resurrection appearances, Jesus' nearest and dearest don't recognize him. And this is worth thinking about. There could be many reasons, of course. You just don't expect somebody who's dead to suddenly be there, so why would you recognize them? But there's something more going on, I think, as well, that there's something about the resurrected body that is significantly dissimilar somehow. Again, how, we don't fully know, and it's, we don't need tonight to think about. Something that's significantly dissimilar about, from the body that we have now. So the question of recognizability is an interesting and complicated one. But nonetheless, that is part of what we have to say and what we hope for. Our deaths, the separation of our souls from bodies, will be overcome, transfigured, when we are finally resurrected, which we will be. All of us will be, not just Christians, everybody. Um, and there are various possibilities there, which we can talk about, if you like. Heaven, hell, and other such complications. But resurrection is universal. No human creature, according to the doctrine of the church, will fail to be resurrected. Um, now, last part. I want us to conclude by thinking together about the range of attitudes we as Christians can have, should have, and should not have to our own sufferings and deaths, and to the sufferings and deaths of others, given the groundwork we've already laid. So, 
first keynote, the first thing that is non-negotiable, essential, always part of a properly ordered response to suffering and death, is lament. If you don't lament somebody's death, and almost everybody does, it comes very easily to us to do this, but there are occasions and there have been movements in the history of human thought where lament has almost vanished. I can't help but mention Marcos Aurelius, not a Christian, but rather a, um, a Stoic, we might say, a Roman emperor of exceedingly vivid and lively intellect. But one of the stories about him shows what I mean. He was brought the news of his son's death. And his response was, what is that to me? I already knew I had begotten a mortal. Not much lament there. Um, you might contrast that with Augustine's response to the death of his mother, which is a very complicated one, but it begins with a reluctance to cry because why should he cry? Because she's in heaven now, right? So everything's fine. But then he cries, he laments. So um, lament is essential. Lament always belongs to our responses to death and to our anticipations of our own because it's not how it's supposed to be, because it's damaged, because it's wrong, because it's horrible. That's, that's keynote one. But lament is not the whole story. And if it becomes the whole story, then we've forgotten Christianity. So there's a keynote two that goes with lament. And the degree to which they are both present is the degree to which the gospel is fully present in our response to death. So the, key, the second keynote is hope. Lament is present, should be present, must be present, but it has to be configured with, not overcome by, but woven together with hope. Hope for what? Hope for resurrection. And hope not just for resurrection, but for resurrection that will bring us into the presence of the Lord forever. It's hope because certainty is not the right word. It's hope because perhaps it can be otherwise. So lament and hope must be interwoven. When one hears, you know, I'm not a priest, so I don't do this, but when one hears funeral homilies, saving your presence, Father Scott, sometimes one hears homilies that are all about celebration and hope. You know, this is all because we know this person is a saint and it's great and so forth. I always get extremely uneasy because the lament has started to leach out bad. Sometimes you hear homilies of quite the other sort where it's all lament from beginning to end. And then the hope has started to leach out. You need them both woven together. And we need to cultivate that for ourselves to weave together lament and hope. So that when we think about our own deaths, remember Pascal's vivid quotation from the beginning? That's not the whole story. That's the lament part of the story. And that part is true. We should lament it. But Pascal, and he knew this, he, of course, being a good Catholic, that's only one part of the story. He supplements that, but doesn't erase it by hope. Hope does not erase it. It's still the case that we're all here chained to the floor with our throats ready to be cut. That's still true. But there's a hope for the transfiguration of that. So that's the two keynotes. In between, there is a third thing. And this is the most difficult to cultivate. I am almost completely incompetent at doing so. But I do think it is a deep part of the tradition. And it is a cultivation of active, joyful acceptance of one's own sufferings to the extent that it's possible to do so. It is never the case that one should actively, joyful accept the sufferings of somebody else. That can't be right. There are other reasons for that. But remember Therese of Lisieux. That's what she's doing. She's actively, joyfully accepting her own sufferings. And she is doing that because the exemplar of our salvation, Jesus, is someone who did that himself, both accepted our sufferings and thus made it possible for us to see ours as participatory in his. 
So this third thing, let's call it joyful acknowledgement, is the hardest thing because it is deeply alien to us. And in its extreme forms, it is clinically crazy to actively seek and delight in suffering, to actively seek and delight in death, is not what the gospel is about. That's the deformed way of doing this. But there is an undeformed way. It is to learn to see everything about oneself, including one's own sufferings, as possibly participatory in, and therefore an act of love for, Jesus. Like I said, this isn't for me. I find it almost impossible to do. When I read Thérèse of Lisieux, I shudder. I find it so uneasy that it's hard to take it seriously. But I know enough about the tradition to know that it's a deep thing in the tradition. And I think we should all acknowledge that. It is possible, not that many of us, I think, know how to do it. It is possible to find some transfiguration of one's own sufferings and one's own imminent death in contemplation of Jesus's sufferings and death. This is a hard saying and a hard thing, but it's not something to be ignored. So what we learn, I think, what we begin to learn from this thinking about Jesus and the effect that that has upon our own understandings and our own responses to suffering and death is that we have to weave together first lament, the ground base, you might say, of all response to death. Second, lament goes together with hope. Doesn't get erased by hope. Lament doesn't erase hope. They're both together, woven together. And third, this joyful vision of the possibility of participation of our sufferings in Jesus' own sufferings. These are, these are matters of um, prayer, meditation, and cultivation. And people do them differently. But those are the three keynotes, I think, that come to us from considering Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. Let me conclude then with the fundamental act that makes sense of all this for Christians. It's why I began with thinking about Jesus and then moved to thinking about us, rather than beginning with thinking about us and then thinking about Jesus. The only, the only act that makes any sense of all this, this complex attitude to response to death and suffering, the only act that makes sense of that is the act of looking at Jesus. You can't reason your way into this. You can't lift yourself by your bootstraps to learn to see the world like this. You can't, by looking at death and suffering, get any of this out of it. The only way that one can begin to see in death and suffering the things that I've just been talking about is to look first, last, and again at Jesus and at Jesus as one who suffers, one who dies, and one who, is, one who is resurrected. Only when that is done, when one begins to develop a habit of doing that, will these outflows of that begin to affect gradually, slowly, always in one's own responses to uh, both one's own and others' death and suffering. So I think that will do for my remarks. It's 25 to 8, late on a Saturday night. But I'd love to have Q&A if you have any thoughts or questions or comments. I see a hand going up already. Yes. Yeah. I have multiple questions, but I'll start with this one. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it isn't proper for us to will the Therese experience onto other people. We don't want them to right. um, this, joyfully acknowledge this, won't you? Right. Okay. Um, is it wrong of me to pray for a painless death on the part of a loved one, as I've done? 
No, I don't think it's wrong. I mean, I think that the point of petitionary and intercessory prayer, I mean, the point, a central point, is to show ourselves to the Lord with as much nakedness as we can muster. And if what you really want, I mean, in the worst of all possible cases, if what you really want is your suffering beloved to have less suffering, then you have to show that to the Lord. Because if you don't show it to the Lord, you're somehow using your intellect to try to obscure yourself from the Lord. So that, if that's what you want, you have to pray for it. Um, I don't think we're ever, ever in a position to know what the best outcome would be. But I think we are often, maybe even usually, in a position to know what really moves us about this. And, you know, I mean, uh, a brief personal story about that. Um, when I was 19 years old, um, my father died quite suddenly one night. Um, uh, I watched him die. And I would very, I very, very much wanted him not to, not to die and not to undergo the suffering that he underwent uh, as he moved from life to death. But I don't have any views about whether in fact that would have been the right thing. I just know that that's how it seemed to me. And I, so that's the best I can do by way of answer to that. Just a quick follow-up question. Um, would you say most of what you said about death, about pain as well. That is, is pain an artifact of the fall? Is it to be lamented? Is it a lie? Is it, is, is yeah, mm. good question. Should our attitude be the same? Right. Yeah, so does the, the homology between death and pain go all the way down and all the way up? I think the short answer is yes. I think that, <clears throat> So the fundamental structure of Christian thought about this kind of stuff, as far as I understand it, is that in thinking about what's wrong, one thinks first about paradise and then about heaven, right? And if it seems reasonable to say that this thing one is thinking about wasn't in paradise and won't be in heaven, that leads to the conclusion there's something really problematic about this. It's not what we're here for. It's not that it's not therefore what we should expect. It's not what the Lord intends. So I would say all of that applies to pain as much as to death. But, 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 or and, not but, and, right? Um, and um, we cannot obviously do without pain here below. The idea that in this life we could be pain-free is incoherent and stupid. Uh, we cannot be. It is part of our constitution to respond with pain to all kinds of things. So when we say that it's damaged, that doesn't mean we wish it erased right now, because that's incoherent. And, but it does mean that we acknowledge what it is. We see it for what it is, which is an artifact of the fall that will be washed away, and there will be no more tears eventually, and no more pain too. So we have to hold all that together. And it's, it, for me, as for everybody, I think, it's easy to move from the thought that this is not how it's supposed to be, to wish that it would just stop. But there's no easy getting from the one to the other, because the world is already so complicatedly articulated with pain and death and hmm, that we can't just wish it all away. That doesn't make any sense at all. It's a matter of hope, not a matter of um, active attempt to remove, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give up the mic. I was just, last comment. It's just interesting that um, in these conversations about theodicy, mm. sometimes pain is spoken of as necessary, as in the best right. possible world, um, sort of a happy fall, but death not. I mean, it tends right. not to be the case. Yeah, I really think that's not the case. I think that's importantly not the case. And one of the, one of the interesting things about the current state of Christian theology is that there are, there are increasing numbers, I think, of, of Catholic and Protestant theologians who are moving toward naturalizing both death and pain, making them part of the proper order of things. And this is just not possible for Christians to do, um, I think. So it's an interesting point of tension in current theological thought, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions that you may have I'm here? I'm
Um, th yes, Karen, go ahead. I don't see any from the online group here. This really isn't a question. I do not want to live a long time. And I figured that out or thought about it a few years ago. Mm. So I'm not interested in longevity, and I wouldn't mind dying right away. I'm with you. But I'm not, I'm not actively seeking right. to try to die. I am not suicidal. Right. I'm not crazy. Right. But I am so excited about meeting the Lord that mm. I can't wait. Right. So that's, I mean, that's uh, my uh, sure, I mean, I think that's great. I, I don't think, uh, remember Augustine, does it matter how long you live? No, not really. I and, uh, right, and so part of the reason is that, that we have hope for something. For me, I'll supplement what you said, and you may not agree with this bit. I think that when you get to be a certain age, it's different for different people. The response is just, you know, enough already. I mean, you know, I have to brush my teeth again, you know? I've been doing this for 65 years. Um, so I think that's, that's also fine. You know, the, the, there's a span, and I, anyway. Yeah, so thank you for that. I think there was one over there, maybe? Yeah, we'll go to the back yeah. end. Uh, you, you might want some water, Paul. He's got, yeah, Jim has some right do. there for thank you. you. Thanks so much. You've got, you've got some time, yeah, right. A lot of responsibility. Of course, right, yeah. So um, your sidebar about this handful of biblical figures who might not have died. Yeah. Um, if it is the case that our resurrected bodies are our bodies but different from our bodies, yeah. and I assume better in the sense of redemption is pluperfect, how do Mary and co. get them? Or are these yeah. people who didn't die just stuck with the current body? I realize this is... I mean, sure. It's a, it's a great question, and it's a lovely one if you want to speculate. Um, so uh, the kind of thing I would like to be true, but I have, there's no, no grounding in the tradition really for any of this, would be that um, if it's really the case that Enoch and Elijah and possibly Mary, and maybe others that we don't know about, were taken up direct, and if, as is likely the case, most Catholic theologians would say this, that um, those still living at the time of the... Uh, return of the general resurrection may not die. Um, so all of those. Um, I'd want to say that whatever it is that transfigures the resurrected body will happen directly and immediately um, as a result of the vision of the triune Lord to Enoch, Elijah, etc. That they too will be transfigured, but not not by having to go through death and then being raised, but their bodies also won't remain the same. They will be distinctively different. So there'll be no, I mean, this is so speculative that we have no real ground for it, but there'll be no difference in the resurrection between those who didn't die and those who did, and nearly, nearly all will have, but not all. So that's what I'd like to say. But I think there are probably other routes one could take too. Yeah. Huh? Hold on one second so they can hear your question on the live stream. When Christ rose, the wounds. The wounds, were yes. Still. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, it's, so the question is about the wounds of Christ. The resurrected body bears them, the evidence of them is there, yes. And again, the standard thing to say in the tradition about this is that the, um, not only the wounds of Christ, but the wounds on the bodies of the martyrs and the others, uh, they're all there, evident in their resurrected bodies. Not painfully there, but there. And I think the generalizable point about that is that um, in one way or another, the marks of our lives on our flesh remain with us. Exactly what that means in detail is hard to say, but it's not that every mark that has affected you will be erased by your resurrection. Um, so yes, the evidences of our lives and our deaths is there on our flesh somehow. That's part of what makes it our flesh, I think. So Jesus is the clearest case, yes, uh, because we have clarity about that from the scriptural accounts. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Jean? Yep. Yeah. 
you said you said some theologians are trying to normalize suffering and death. Naturalize it. Na so I don't understand. Well, let me give you an example. I'll back into it like this. Some theologians, they tend to be Thomist in persuasion, but let's not worry about that. That's to say they're like Thomas Aquinas. Um, we all have our problems, and that's one that some theologians have. Um, some theologians would say, for example, of tigers, that it is natural to them to be killers. That's their nature. That's what they do. They can't live any other way, so they're killers. Some will even say that it's natural to some other animals, let's say gazelles, to be victims. That's what they do. They get killed by tigers, right? Um, and the idea of natural there is that it's intrinsic or proper to those creatures to be like that. It's what makes them what they are. So on that idea of natural, some will say, it's intrinsic or natural to us to die. It's part of our natural order to do that. So it's not then, or may not be, an artifact of the fall. It's not a product of sin, or not necessarily. It may simply be part of what we are. That's what is meant by this. I think that's not a defensible line, but it is a line you'll hear taken, right? And we have to acknowledge, I think, the following, that it's just about impossible for us to imagine what it's like not to be mortal, not to be subject to death. We have no grasp on that. We can say formally what it means, but we can't imaginatively. So when people say, you can't imagine a tiger that doesn't kill things, quite right, I can't. But that doesn't mean there couldn't be one. It just means that my imagination is severely limited, um, similarly with our own mortality. So that's the kind of idea. Um, yeah. John, you look like you're ready to ask something else. This will be my last question. Um, at one point you said that this way of thinking about death is something you can only discern after or see by first looking at Christ. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there isn't something like a natural theology of death that would challenge what you said. It begins with the observation that a lot of people, Christian, non-Christian, so forth, naturally recoil from death and see in it something unnatural. Mm -hmm. Like you, you see a body that's living and then you see that it's dead and you think that just doesn't make sense mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and you naturally want to overcome it. Right? Other animals don't do that. Um, so do you think, is there some basis there that all humans Mm. sense and then but of course the Christian story <clears throat> helps us make sense of that yes um, so I think the way to to handle that is a question of how much and what you want to do with it when you've got as much as you can get um, I'm not I think that what we can say about generic human existence is pretty limited. Um, that's, and the reason for that is that we are, uh, here's one thing one can say, that we, we do seem to be as creatures ones who are very largely open to formation by broadly cultural factors. We're very unlike, let's say, Yellow jackets. Yellow jackets, you know, I mean, they're just going to do what they do. I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do. You can kill them or you can let them get on with what they do, but they're just going to do that. We, we are not much like that. We are open, unformed, uh, and always get a lot of formation. Sometimes it's Christian formation, sometimes it's something else. Um, and so when you get developed responses to death that often include this horror at it, um, they tend to always already be inflected with a whole lot of things, some of which are compatible with Christians, some of which aren't. So it depends, I think, on how far one wants to go with them. Um, yeah, so that would be the beginnings of it. And I, I do want to say one other thing um, about this, because, you know, I've, I was speaking to Christians about Christianity. Therefore, the Jesus talk, right? 
but I want to say at least the following about people who are not necessarily Christians, and in particular about Jews, about Israel. If you accept, as the church teaches, that the God of Jesus Christ and the God of the people of Israel are the same God, that's church doctrine to say so, so you, you, if you don't think so, there's uphill work to do. Um, if that's right, then when Jews contemplate the God they worship, they are in fact contemplating the God we also do. And that is a God who is, as we know, triune. Jews know things about that God that we do not. We don't even know what they are that we don't know them, but they know things that we don't know. So Israel, in contemplating that God, can and does understand and come to a reasoned response to the kinds of things I've been talking about without using the name of Jesus for it. So that's an important qualification to what I was saying before. And there are other ones that one could make, but that's a really important one because otherwise the Jesus talk can lead to the thought that anyone who doesn't confess Jesus can't see any of this. And that can't be quite right. So, yeah. I can't see death correctly. Right, yeah. right. Other questions, comments, concerns? I, um, I'll, uh, something you said, or, or, uh, I'll refute something you said earlier. Actually, you said, uh, none of us will be alive in 50 years. I'll be 98, so oh, okay. I think, Sorry. you know, I'll, uh, <laughs> I intend to, John is, you'll be, you're probably younger than me, John, so so you may, you and I may both still be around at that. I, I think I said 60, but maybe I, <laughs> no, I think you said, we have it on recording, uh, right, so you yes. can see. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Yeah, and, right. And, and I'll note, uh, to, 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 of course, in all of this, and you made a reference to it, so, you know, there's the church principle of Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, right? The law of prayer is the law of belief. If you want to know what the church believes, look at how she prays. So within Holy Week, right, all of this is expressed in liturgical form. So the church prays all of this, all of her theology about the Paschal mystery of suffering, death, and resurrection within the sacred Paschal Triduum is expressed in a beautiful way. I mean, that's among the among the treasures of the treasures of the faith is Holy Week, where we kind of live all of this out. So just a little point on that. Yeah, and I, I, let me just underscore further that. I mean, one of the most moving, to the point of, of tear-inducing moments of the liturgical year is the stripping of the altars that happens during the Triduum to mark this. It's just overpowering, I think, you know, the, the removal of the presence. That's, and that's, as you say, that's like surrounding Lex Grinney. I think many Catholics understand this very well, even if they couldn't necessarily explain it to you. And I think the reason for that is just the power of the liturgy. The liturgy actually works on people without them being able to say what exactly it's doing to them. Yeah, it's a start. If you think about like on Good Friday, how the ch church looks, right? With the open tabernacle, no flowers, no candles, the bare yeah, altar, it's just, stark. Yeah. And then, then you compare that to how we do the Easter vigil when you know the people kind of walk in with as the Gloria is sung with the with the flowers and the altar is dressed and the candle is lit, the lights come on, you know this that idea of of suffering, death, and then resurrection happening. So, yeah. if you ever want to attract someone to the faith, bring them to Holy Week. <laughs> yeah. You know <laughs> the beauty of this. What it's going to be Catholic will come. There's going to be a lot going on. It's going to be overwhelming. I'll explain it all afterwards. Yeah, right. But this is what it's about so yeah good yeah. great well very good well uh thanks so much for being with us this evening for uh Pleasure. speaking with us thank, thank you. you and um so we have lined up year two of our adult uh, faith development series as we kind of go into um uh prayer and spirituality so uh we're going to be uh Let's talk about uh, our Catholic ways of praying and um, saints and their spirituality and um, things around the devotional life of the church as well, all those things. So we start with what do we believe, um, you know, and how do we 
pray. And then the last year is about discipleship. What do we do with it? So how we draw them in. So uh, in January, they're all on the 15th of the month uh, next year. So uh, Dr. Tim O'Malley from, uh, from the McGrath Institute at Notre Dame will be with us January 15th. Uh, Father Michael Burbick, the pastor of St. Michael and Kerry, is with us March 15th. And then uh, Sister Laura Downing, uh, a, a IHM sister who I taught with at Cardinal Gibbons, who now is at Immaculata University, Pennsylvania. She'll be with us in October of next year. So that's kind of our lineup for next year. We've all been, been secured, so more to come. Great, so thank you for being here. Thank you for those of, who have joined us online. And uh, we'll push this out in one, one, one of our f f f future emails, so you can have it there as well. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Let's see. Yeah.